So let's start the next session. It's uh, the first of two sessions on secure computation. Uh, the first talk is a paper by Gilad Asharov. It's towards characterizing complete fairness in secure two-party computation. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about secure multi-party computation. In secure multi-party computation, we have some set of parties. Each has some private input, and the parties wish to compute some joint function of their input. For instance, we can look at average of salaries. Each party has a salary, and we want to compute the average of our salaries. But my salary is some private input. I don't want to reveal it to anyone. So how can we compute something on our inputs without revealing the input? And security should be preserved even when some of the parties are corrupted, collude, trying to gain some more information about the outputs than they, they allowed. Uh, deviate from the protocol specification, so on and so forth. And the security properties that we want to ensure is our correctness, privacy, independence of input, and fairness. And fairness is the security property that we're going to focus, focus on in this talk. So what is fairness? Uh, essentially, fairness may, means that if one party learns the output, then all parties should learn the output. We want to prevent the case when one party learns the output without the other parties. In some sense, the parties interact between them and then somewhat magically learn the output simultaneously at the same time. So this is something very strong that we want to achieve. Um, complete fairness. And we know, we know that fairness can be achieved when we have an honest majority in the multi-party case. And the question is what happens when we have no honest majority or in the spatial case of two-party setting. In these settings, it seems uh, that it's much more difficult to achieve fairness because one party is corrupted. After it learns its output, it can abort and prevent the, out the other from learning its output. And indeed, in 1986, Cleve showed that fairness is impossible to achieve in general. Specifically, he showed that the coin tossing functionality, where the parties just want to toss a fair coin between them, such that the coin will be uniform and no party can bias the result, this simple functionality cannot be computed with complete fairness. Those, those exist one party that can bias the result. And this implies, this impossibility result implies that the Boolean XO function, this very simple function here, cannot be computed fairly as well. Because if we have an implementation for XO, we have coin tossing for free. And because these two very simple functions cannot be computed fairly, for years the accepted belief was that nothing non-trivial can be computed with complete fairness. When I say no, no, uh, trivial function, I mean either functions that depends, either constant functions or functions that depends on only one party's input. And for this, because of Cleve's impossibility and the XO that is impossible, the accepted belief was that nothing can be computed fairly. And we had many, many notions of partial fairness where we don't have complete fairness. We don't have the, the parties do not learn the outputs at the same time, but, uh, but one party has some advantage over the other. So we have some notions of partial fairness, uh, but no, not complete fairness. And we had many, many works and many, many notions of partial fairness. And for two decades, there were no results on complete fairness. Until 2008, Gordon Chazai, Katz, and Linder, which is going to be GHKL from now, show that there exist some non-trivial functions that can be computed with complete fairness. So fairness is sometimes possible. Essentially, uh, specifically, they show that this function, where the part is, which is the greater than function, or the million odds problem, or for, two, for uh, the case of domain of size 2, this is exactly the Boolean OR function or the Boolean N function can be computed fairly. Now, this function doesn't contain 
an embedded XO. It means that it doesn't contain, we don't have two inputs for both parties that between themselves they are XO. And you may think that maybe XO is the barrier for fairness. But then they showed another protocol, which is much more general, and consider a specific, specific function that does contain an embedded XOR, and show that this function can be computed fairly as well. So XOR is not, embedded XOR is not the barrier for fairness. So fairness is not sometimes possible, and now we have examples of functions that can be computed fairly, some other examples of functions that cannot be computed fairly. And this raises the following fundamental question, which functions can and which functions cannot be computed with complete fairness? We want to characterize, to understand when and why fairness is possible or impossible. We want some properties on the functions that will tell us whether the functions can be computed fairly or not. And again, the only possibility result that we have for these settings is that of Cleave. The only possibility result that we have is that of GHKL, and we have only few examples of functions that can be computed fairly. And when I say this setting, I mean I focus on deterministic Boolean function to final domain and malicious adversary. Okay, so we have very limited results. We want to understand when fairness is possible. So we had two, two works on this topic. In TCC last year, together with my advisor, Yuda Lindel and Tal Rabin, we focused on Cleave's impossibility and tried to rule out which functions imply fair coin tossing and therefore are ruled out by this impossibility. Okay? We found some property, we defined some property on a truth table of the function, such that if the function satisfies the property, it implies fair coin tossing, therefore it's impossible to compute fairly. And if it doesn't imply, the, if it doesn't satisfy the property, then it doesn't imply for a coin tossing, it means that we cannot use this function to toss a coin. And potentially, it may be possible that it can be computed fairly. In this book, we're going to focus on the positive result of GHKL on their protocol. And we're going to uh, perform some deeper analysis on their protocol to understand what exactly the functions that can be computed using this protocol. What functions can and what functions cannot be computed with the protocol. And it turns out that the results are quite surprising. If we focus uh, on functions where the domains, Boolean functions, where the domains are distinct, it turns out that almost everything is possible. Namely, if you uh, uh, choose a random, a random a function from this family, then with probability that almost one, one minus negligible, it can be computed fairly. And it's not that only that random functions can be computed, it's also very interesting tasks can be computed fairly and in interesting and important tasks. For, for example, Set membership, when one party uh, holds some subset, the other party holds some element, and we want to find out whether my element is in your subset, this function can be computed fairly. Another example, private evaluation of Boolean function. One function, one party holds function, the other party holds uh, some input, and we want to evaluate the function in your input, this is also fair. Other example, private matchmaking, one holds profile, the other holds a set of pre preferences, also fair. A subset B, set disjointness, and more and more. So we have not only that, very, uh, a lot of functions that can be computed fairly, also interesting functions can be computed fairly. So I want to just state the result of this paper in general. Uh, so we show that almost, we, we define some property that guarantees fairness, that tells us whether the function can be computed using GHKL. And we show that almost all functions where the sizes of the domain are distinct satisfy this property, and therefore almost all functions with X, with the, where the domains are distinct, where the sizes of the domain are distinct, can be computed using the protocol and can be computed fairly. On the other hand, 
we have some another property that says that the functions cannot be computed using the protocol, at least with some specific simulation strategy. And we show that almost all functions where the sizes of domain are the same satisfy this property and therefore they cannot be computed using this protocol. Uh, with one exception, if the function has some monochromatic input, it has an input that no matter what the input of the other party, the output is always the same, always one, always zero. Then although the sizes of the domain is the same, it still may be possible. And I want to address that the characterization of GHKL that we show here is not tight. Uh, there are functions that are left unknown that the GHKL protocol itself may be, uh, may, be uh, may compute them fairly. And, and but we show that only negligible amount of functions for each size fall in this, uh, in this uh, that are left unknown. OK, so if we combine our result with the characterization of uh, coin tossing, what we get is that there are class of functions that are impossible because they imply fair coin tossing. There is another class of pass, uh, functions that are possible because they can be computed using GHKL. And we have some other class of functions which are left unknown for, for them. The only impossibility result that we have, which is coin tossing, doesn't apply. And also, the only possibility result, or the only technique that we know how to achieve fairness, doesn't apply either. And therefore, we're left with a large class of functions that we just have no clue whether fairness is possible or not. OK, just to show how the things are subtle, look at these three functions which seems very, very uh, a close one to another. And the function on the left is impossible. This is exactly the A equals B function. It implies coin tossing. The function on the right is possible. And the function in the middle, it's maybe the most, the simplest functions that are found that is uh, left unknown. OK? So we've some differences in the functions and everything changes. OK, so now for the technical part. Um, I'm not going to focus a lot on the protocol of GHKL. I'm going to say some words about it. So the protocol of GHKL is very, very uh, general protocol. It may compute very fine a lot of functions. And the protocol is designed such that there exists some spatial round I star for which in this round the parties learn the correct output. OK, so the protocol, the parties exchange information between them and send messages to one another. The, the protocol is designed such that the only possible attack is a bolt. And the protocol is designed such that until round I star, the output of the parties is just uh, some random values that depends on their inputs only. OK, so the outputs until some round I star are uncorrelated. The output of the X part is just its input on some random value, let's say uniform, for the other party, and the same for uh, the Y part. Add star, starting at I star, the, the outputs are correct. And the idea is that the parties cannot identify I star in advance. Uh, so the protocol is just we have some round until around I star, everything is uncorrelated. And from our round I star, everything is the correct output. Now, at around I star, the X party learns the output before the Y, y party. OK, and that's because we need to to send messages and cannot send messages simultaneously. So first, Y send a message to X, and those X learns the correct output. And only afterward, X send its message to Y, and Y learns its output. So regarding security, so PY is always the second to receive output. And the fourth simulation is easy and possible for all, all functions. OK, we have no problem of fairness. Fairness is not an issue 
where what the corrupted party is Y. But we do have some problem when the X party is the first to receive an error. Uh, P, on the other hand, PX is always the first to receive output. Add ISTAR would learn the output before the Y party. And therefore, we do have some problem to simulate this, this uh, thing because we don't have complete fairness, at least uh, not for all functions. And simulation is possible only for some functions. We cannot simulate this protocol for all functions. And just to recall the definition of complete fairness, what we want to show that this protocol satisfies at least for some functions, the following, the parties send their inputs to the trusted party, it computes the functions for them, and send them the outputs simultaneously, exactly at the same time. So we want to say that this protocol satisfies this notion for some functions. We want to understand what are the functions. So the simulation is non-trivial, and there is some issue that is going on there. And now I'm not going to focus on the simulation itself and not why does it work. I'm going to focus on what property we need from the function in order that the simulation will work. Okay? So let's take a look at the ideal model. In the ideal model, we have the simulator, which is the ideal adversary. And it has two choices when it sends its input to the trusted party. It has two, two, two choices what to do. The first choice is either it wants to learn the correct output. That is, it wants to send the correct output to the trusted party and learn something from the trusted party. But once it do, does so, the honest party learns the correct output as well. The other choice that he has is either to manipulate the honest party output. What do I mean by that? I don't want, the simulator doesn't want to send something that, and, and learn something from the trusted party. It doesn't care what the response of the trusted party will be. It just sends something random according to some distribution, and the only aim of the simulator is to manipulate the output of the honest party because by sending my input to the trusted party, I can manipulate outputs of the honest party. And I don't care what the, what the trusted party gives me back. So it turns out for some functions, the ideal world adversary can manipulate the output of the honest party more than for some other functions. Okay? We have some functions that allows you in the ideal model to manipulate the outputs more than some other functions. In order to understand what I mean, let's take a look about this function for which Judge Kale showed that it's possible. So in these functions, if the adversary aborts before round I star, the Y party, which is the honest party in our case, is going to learn the evaluation of the function on its true input on some random value, uniformly chosen value of the X party. This is what happens in the real. What does it mean? It means that if its input is y1, the output is going to be 1 with probability 2 felt, exactly 2 felt. And if the output is y2, the probability of achieving 1, of uh, viewing 1, is uh, exactly 2 felt. Now, it turns out that the simulator needs to s manipulate these values. Okay. He wants to achieve this output distribution. So we want to increment the first coordinate, but without changing the second coordinate. And this is something the simulation needs in order to simulate the protocol. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, talk about why it needs these manipulations. Just mention that this is what it needs. And the only question is, can it achieve this output distribution? Can it actually make this happen. Now, recall that he doesn't know why, what y is. He has no idea what to send. He just needs to pick some x, send it to the trusted party, and then get an output. And he wants that the same output will be. We want something that, in the case of y2, it's, it will look like a uniform output. But in case of y1, it will be something like that. 
Uh, so it turns out that it can do that. Okay? If it chooses its input according to this input distribution, then we actually achieve this property. We achieve this output even without knowing why. Okay? If I choose the x according to this output distribution, then we achieve this output. And now it can do that also if you want to manipulate only the second coordinate, but but be with the same uh, output distribution for the first coordinate, can I do it also? If you want to manipulate both coordinates, it turns out that in function, it can do it also. It can play however it wants. And the full simulation is possible. So what about this function? Now, again, if about before I star, then we get something that is uniform. And but if we want to manipulate, we want to increment only in the first coordinate. We don't want to change, make any change in the second coordinate. Can we do so? Can the simulator can choose an input such that this will be the output? And the answer is no. Why is that? In order to achieve this output distribution, we must choose its input according. We choose one, x1 with probability 1 half and x2 with probability 1 half plus epsilon, and this is not a valid prob probability or input distribution. It's not possible. Okay? In geometric representation, what we have, um, so all the possible input distributions, all the possible uh, values or x's that I can send to the trusted party, I, I can choose x1 with probability p, x2 with probability 1 minus p, what we get is this output distribution, namely, if the input of the y part is y1, then we get 1 with probability 1 minus p. And if the output is y2, we get 1 with probability p. And this is exactly the line segment, ge geometrically, what we have here is exactly the line segment between the two points, 0, 1, and 1, 0. Okay, the x axis here is the output in case that the input is y1. And the y is the case of y2. And all the output distributions lie in this line segment. What we have on the other uh, function, we have three possible choices. We can choose x1 with probability p1, x2 with probability p2, and x3 with probability y minus p1 minus p2. And those are all the output distributions, which geometrically is the triangle between the three rows of the function, which is 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 0. So here, if I fix a point inside the, sim the if fix a point here, I can manipulate and move to any other point around me. I can manipulate the outputs however I want. On the other, uh, when, on, on the other end here, I cannot manipulate too much. And this is because we have some strong correlation in the output, in case the y part has some strong correlation between the case that its output is y1 and the case where its output is y2, its input is y2. OK, so here what we have is a geometric object of uh, dimension 1. This is geometric object of dimension 2. And as we, we see, the GHKL simulator needs to be able to manipulate each coordinate separately it needs some specific points that are around the real, the, real output of the, the real output protocol. And all those points are inside the region where the, the simulator can reach. On the other end, in the XL function, it doesn't matter where we put the real, the real execution the, the, for any parameters of the real execution. The simulator will always need points that are around, around it. It needs to manipulate output and it needs points that it cannot reach. And therefore, and we know that this is impossible in general, this function, so it's not a surprise that the protocol doesn't move. So just to generalize it, we view, for any function, we view the rows of the function as points. We define a full dimensional function, say the function is full dimensional. If the geometric object that is de de defined by the function is of dimension m, now, theorem says that if the function is full dimension, then it can be computed with complete fairness. Just an example, in higher dimensions, we have here in, in R3, 
This is the geometric object, and what the simulator needs is exactly the ball inside. Um, OK. So what does it mean to be full dimension? It means that all the rows do not lie on a single hyperplane, plane, which essentially means that if we view our function as the truth table of our functions, then for every hyperplane, which is Q and delta, this doesn't hold. When we multiply by Q, we don't get the whole delta vector, which essentially means that now we have a very easy to check criterion to check whether a function is full dimensional or not. All that we need to show is just to solve the linear equations for mf equals 1. We just need to see that there is no solution for this equation, set of equations. And for this set of equations, what we have is the only trivial. This solves, it means that the function is of full dimension. Uh, we also have a possibility result that if the function is not full dimensional, it means that all the points lie on a single hyperplane. And we show that if the hyperplane does not pass through the region, then f cannot be computed using GHKL. And using combinatorics, as I mentioned, almost all functions with distinct domain sizes are full dimensional and, cannot, and therefore can be computed. And all the functions with x equals y cannot be computed using GHKL. What's else in the paper? So we have something for monochromatic input in case where x equals y. We also show, say, for asymmetric functions, that is functions where the output, we show possibility where the outputs of the parties are not necessarily the same. And we have the first positive result of functions which are not Boolean. And here we have some criteria where the ratio of the, the, of the domains is greater than the alphabet minus one. OK, that's it. Thank you. setting up, I'll do the next introduction. So the, the, the second talk of this session is on the cryptographic complexity of the worst functions. It's with Amos Bimo, Yuval Ishai, Ranjit Kumarasan, and Al Kushalevitz, and Ranjit will give the talk. <laughs>